Track 32. The Woman in White. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Woman in White by Wilkie Collins. Read by Tim Bulkley of BigBible.org. Patty Brugman. Track 32. The Third Epoch. 11. The inquest uh, was hurried for certain local reasons which weighed with the coroner and the town authorities. It was held on the afternoon of the next day. I was necessarily one of the witnesses summoned to assist the object of the investigation. My first proceeding in the morning was to go to the post office and inquire for the letter which I expected from Marion. No change of circumstances, however extraordinary, could affect the one great anxiety which weighed on my mind while I was away from London. The morning's letter, which was the only assurance I could receive that no misfortune had happened in my absence, was still the absorbing interest with which my day began. To my relief, the letter from Marion was at the office waiting for me. Nothing had happened. They were both as safe and as well as when I had left them. Laura sent her love, and begged that I should let her know of my return a day beforehand. Her sister added, in explanation of this message, that she had saved nearly a sovereign out of her own private purse and that she had claimed the privilege of ordering the dinner, and giving the dinner which was to celebrate the day of my return. I read these little domestic confidences in the bright morning, with the terrible recollection of what had happened the evening before vivid in my memory. The necessity of sparing Laura any sudden knowledge of the truth was the first consideration which the letter suggested to me. I wrote at once to Marian to tell her what I have told in these pages, presenting the tidings as gradually and gently as I could, and warning her not to let any such thing as a newspaper fall in Laura's way while I was absent. In the case of any other woman, less courageous and less reliable, I might have hesitated before I ventured on unreservedly disclosing the whole truth. But I owed it to Marian to be faithful to my past experience of her, and to trust her as I trusted myself. My letter was necessarily a long one. It occupied me until the time came for proceeding to the inquest. The objects of the legal inquiry were necessarily beset by peculiar complications and difficulties. Besides the investigation into the manner in which the deceased had met his death, there were serious questions to be settled relating to the cause of the fire, to the abstraction of the keys, and to the presence of a stranger in the vestry at the time when the flames broke out. Even the identification of the dead man had not yet been accomplished. The helpless condition of the servant had made the police distrustful of his asserted recognition of his master. They had sent to Knowlesbury overnight to secure the attendance of witnesses who were well acquainted with the personal appearance of Sir Percival Glyde, and they had communicated the first thing in the morning with Blackwater Park. These precautions enabled the coroner and jury to settle the question of identity, and to confirm the correctness of the servant's assertion. The evidence offered by competent witnesses, and by the discovery of certain facts, being subsequently strengthened by an examination of the dead man's watch. The crest and the name of Sir Percival Glyde were engraved inside it. The next inquiry is related to the fire. The servant and I, and the boy who had heard the light struck in the vestry, were the first witnesses called. The boy gave his evidence clearly enough, but the servant's mind had not yet recovered the shock inflicted on it. He was plainly incapable of assisting the objects of the inquiry and he was desired to stand down. To my own relief, my examination was not a long one. I had not known the deceased, I had never seen him, I was not aware of his presence in Old Wilmingham, and I had not been in the vestry at the finding of the body. All I could prove was that I had stopped at the clerk's cottage to ask my way, that I had heard from him the loss of the keys, that I had accompanied him to the church to render what help I could, that I had seen the fire, that I had heard some person unknown inside the vestry trying vainly to unlock the door, and that I had done what I could from motives of humanity to save the man. Other witnesses who had been acquainted with the deceased were asked if they could explain the mystery of his presumed abstraction of the keys and his presence in the burning room. But the coroner seemed to take it for granted, naturally enough, that I, as a total stranger in the neighbourhood, and a total stranger to Sir Percival Glyde, could not be in a position to offer any evidence on these two points. The course that I was myself bound to take when my formal examination had closed seemed clear to me. 
I did not feel called on to volunteer any statement of my own private convictions, in the first place because my doing so could serve no practical purpose, now that all proof in support of any surmises of mine was burnt with the burnt register, in the second place because I could not have intelligibly stated my opinion, my unsupported opinion, without disclosing the whole story of the conspiracy, and producing beyond a doubt the same unsatisfactory effect on the mind of the coroner and the jury which I had already produced on the mind of Mr. Kyle. In these pages, however, and after the time that has now elapsed, no such cautions and restraints, as I here described, need fetter the free expression of my opinion. I will state, briefly, before my pen occupies itself with other events, how my own convictions led me to account for the abstraction of the keys, for the outbreak of the fire, and for the death of the man. The news of my being free on bail drove Sir Percival, as I believe, to his last resources. The attempted attack on the road was one of those resources, and the suppression of all practical proof of his crime by destroying the page of the register on which the forgery had been committed was the other, and the surest of the two. If I could produce no extract from the original book to compare with the certified copy at Knowlesbury, I could produce no positive evidence, and could threaten him with no fatal exposure. All that was necessary to the attainment of his end was that he should get into the vestry unperceived, that he should tear out the page in the register, and that he should leave the vestry again as privately as he had entered it. On this supposition it is easy to understand why he waited till nightfall before he made the attempt and why he took advantage of the clerk's absence to possess himself of the keys. Necessity would oblige him to strike a light to find his way to the right register, and common caution would suggest his locking the door on the inside in case of intrusion on the part of any inquisitive stranger, or on my part if I happened to be in the neighbourhood at the time. I cannot believe that it was any part of his intention to make the destruction of the register appear to be the result of accident, by purposely setting the vestry on fire. The bare chance that prompt assistance might arrive, and that the books might by the remotest possibility be saved, would have been enough on a moment's consideration to dismiss any idea of this sort from his mind. Remembering the quantity of combustible objects in the vestry, the straw, the papers, the packing cases, the dry wood, the old worm-eaten presses, all the probabilities, in my estimation, point to the fire as the result of an accident with his matches or his light. His first impulse under these circumstances was doubtless to try to extinguish the flames, and failing in that his second impulse, ignorant as he was of the state of the lock, had been to attempt to escape by the door which had given him entrance. When I had called to him the flames must have reached across the door leading into the church, on either side of which the presses extended, and close to which other combustible objects were placed. In all probability the smoke and flame confined as they were to the room, had been too much for him when he tried to escape by the inner door. He must have dropped in his death swoon. He must have sunk in the place where he was found, just as I got on the roof to break the skylight window. Even if we had been able afterwards to get into the church and to burst open the door from that side, the delay must have been fatal. He would have been long past saving by that time. We should only have given the flames free ingress into the church. The church, which was now preserved, but which, in that event, would have shared the fate of the vestry. There is no doubt in my mind, there can be no doubt in the mind of any one, that he was a dead man before ever we got to the empty cottage and worked with might and main to tear down the beam. This is the nearest approach of any theory of mine can make towards accounting for the result which was a visible matter of fact. As I have described them, so events passed to us outside as I have related it, so his body was found. The inquest was adjourned over one day, no explanation that the eye of the law could recognize having been discovered thus far to account for the mysterious circumstances of the case. It was arranged that more witnesses should be summoned, and that the London solicitor of the deceased should be invited to attend. A medical man was also charged with the duty of reporting on the mental condition of the servant which appeared at present to debar him from giving any evidence of the least importance. He could only declare in a dazed way that he had been ordered on the night of the fire to wait in the lane, and that he knew nothing else except that the deceased was certainly his master. My own impression 
was that he had been first used, without any guilty knowledge on his own part, to ascertain the fact of the clerk's absence from home on the previous day, and that he had been afterwards ordered to wait near the church, but out of sight of the vestry, to assist his master in the event of my escaping the attack on the road, and of a collision occurring between Sir Percival and myself. It is necessary to add that the man's own testimony was never obtained to confirm this view. The medical report of him declared that what little mental faculty he possessed was seriously shaken, nothing satisfactory was extracted from him at the adjourned inquest, and, for aught I know to the contrary, he may never have recovered to this day. I returned to the hotel at Wilmingham, so jaded in body and mind, so weakened and depressed by all I had gone through, as to be quite unfit to endure the local gossip about the inquest, and to answer the trivial questions that the talkers addressed to me in the coffee-room. I withdrew from my scanty dinner to my cheap garret chamber, to secure myself a little quiet, and to think undisturbed of Laura and Marian. If I had been a richer man I would have gone back to London, and I would have comforted myself with the sight of the two dear faces again that night, but I was bound to appear if called on at the adjourned inquest, and doubly bound to answer my bail before the magistrate at Knowlesbury. Our slender resources had suffered already, and the doubtful future, more doubtful than ever now, made me dread decreasing our means unnecessarily, by allowing myself an indulgence, even at the small cost of a double railway journey in the carriages of the second class. The next day, the day immediately following the inquest, was left at my own disposal. I began the morning by again applying at the post-office for my regular report from Marion. It was waiting for me as before, and it was written throughout in good spirits. I read the letter thankfully, and then set forth with my mind at ease for the day to go to Old Birmingham, and to view the scene of the fire in the morning light. What changes met me when I got there? Through all the ways of our unintelligible world, the trivial and the terrible walk hand in hand together. The irony of circumstances holds no mortal catastrophe in respect. When I reached the church, the trampled condition of the burial ground was the only serious trace left to tell of the fire and the death. A rough hoarding of boards had been knocked up before the vestry doorway. Rude caricatures were scrawled on it already, and the village children were fighting and shouting for the possession of the best peephole to see through. At the point where I had heard the cry for help from the burning room, on the spot where the panic-stricken servant had dropped to his knees. A fussy flock of poultry was now scrambling for the first choice of worms after the rain, and on the ground at my feet, where the door and its dreadful burden had been laid, a workman's dinner was waiting for him, tied up in a yellow basin, and his faithful cur in charge was yelping at me for coming near the food. The old clerk, looking idly at the slow commencement of the repairs, had only one interest that he could talk about now, the interest of escaping all blame for his own part on account of the accident that had happened. One of the village women, whose white, wild face I remembered the picture of terror when we pulled down the beam, was giggling with another woman, the picture of inanity over an old washing-tub. There is nothing serious in mortality. Solomon in all his glory was Solomon with the elements of the contemptible lurking in every fold of his robes and every corner of his palace. As I left the place, my thoughts turned, not for the first time, to the complete overthrow that all present hope of establishing Laura's identity had now suffered through Sir Percival's death. He was gone, and with him the chance was gone, which had been the one object of all my labours and all my hopes. Could I look at my failure from no truer point of view than this? Suppose he had lived. Would that change of circumstances have altered the result? Could I have made my discovery a marketable commodity, even for Laura's sake, after I had found out that the robbery of the rights of others was the essence of Sir Percival's crime? Could I have offered the price of my silence for his confession of the conspiracy, when the effect of that silence must have been to keep the right heir from the estates and the right owner from the name? Impossible. If Sir Percival had lived, the discovery from which in my ignorance of the true nature of the secret I had hoped so much, could not have been mine to suppress or to make public, as I thought best, for the vindication of Laura's rights. In common honesty and common honour, 
I must have gone at once to the stranger whose birthright had been usurped. I must have renounced the victory at the moment when it was mine, by placing my discovery unreservedly in that stranger's hands. I must have faced afresh all the difficulties which stood between me and the one object of my life, exactly as I was resolved in my heart of hearts to face them now. I returned to Wilmingham with my mind composed, feeling more sure of myself and my resolution than I had felt yet. On my way to the hotel I passed the end of the square in which Mrs. Catherick lived. Should I go back to the house, and make another attempt to see her? No. That news of Sir Percival's death, which was the last news she ever expected to hear, must have reached her hours since. All the proceedings at the inquest had been reported in the local paper that morning. There was nothing I could tell her which she did not know already. My interest in making her speak had slackened. I remembered the furtive hatred in her face when she said, There is no news of Sir Percival that I don't expect, except the news of his death. I remembered the stealthy interest in her eyes when they settled on me at parting, after she had spoken those words. Some instinct, deep in my heart, which I felt to be a true one, made the prospect of again entering her presence repulsive to me. I turned away from the square and went straight back to the hotel. Some hours later, while I was resting in the coffee-room, a letter was placed in my hands by the waiter. It was addressed to me by name, and I found on inquiry that it had been left at the bar by a woman just as it was near dusk, and just before the gas was lighted. She had said nothing, and she had gone away again before there was time to speak to her, or even notice who she was. I opened the letter. It was neither dated nor signed, and the handwriting was palpably disguised. Before I had read the first sentence, however, I knew who my correspondent was. Mrs. Catherick. The letter ran as follows. I copy it exactly, word for word. The story continued by Mrs. Catherick. Sir, you have not come back as you said you would. No matter, I know the news, and I write to tell you so. Did you see anything in particular in my face when you left me? I was wondering in my own mind whether the day of his downfall had come at last, and whether you were the chosen instrument for working it. You were, and you have worked it. You were weak enough, as I have heard, to try and save his life. If you had succeeded, I should have looked upon you as my enemy. Now you have failed. I hold you as my friend. Your inquiries frightened him into the vestry by night. Your inquiries without your privity and against your will have served the hatred and wrecked the vengeance of three and twenty years. Thank you, sir, in spite of yourself. I owe something to the man who has done this. How can I pay my debt? If I was a young woman, still I might say, Come, put your arm around my waist and kiss me if you like. I should have been fond enough of you even to go that length, and you would have accepted my invitation. You would, sir, twenty years ago. But I am an old woman now. Well, I can satisfy your curiosity and pay my debt in that way. You had a great curiosity to know certain private affairs of mine when you came to see me, private affairs which all your sharpness could not look into without my help private affairs which you have not discovered even now. You shall discover them. Your curiosity shall be satisfied. I will take any trouble to please you, my estimable young friend. You were a little boy, I suppose, in the year 27. I was a handsome young woman at that time, living at Old Wellingham. I had a contemptible fool for a husband. I had also the honor of being acquainted never mind how, with a certain gentleman, never mind whom. I shall not call him by his name. Why should I? It was not his own. He never had a name, you know that, by this time, as well as I do. It will be more to the purpose to tell you how he worked himself into my good graces. I was born with the tastes of a lady, and he gratified them. In other words, he admired me, and he made me presents. No woman can resist admiration in presents, especially presents provided they happen to be just the thing she wants. He was sharp enough to know that most men are. Naturally, he wanted something in return. All men do. And what do you think was the something? 
the merest trifle nothing but the key of the vestry the key of the press inside it when my husband's back was turned of course he lied when i asked him why he wished me to get him the keys in that private way he might have saved himself the trouble i didn't believe him i liked my presence and i wanted more so i got him the keys without my husband's knowledge and i watched him without his knowledge once twice four times i watched him and the fourth time i found him out i was never over scrupulous where other people's affairs were concerned and i was not over scrupulous about his adding one of the marriages in the register of his own account of course i knew it was wrong but it did no harm to me which was one good reason for not making a fuss about it and i had not got a gold watch and chain which was another still better and he had promised me one from london only the day before which was the third and best of all if i had known what the law considered the crime to be and how the law punished it i should have taken proper care of myself and have exposed him then and there but i knew nothing and i longed for the gold watch all the conditions i insisted on were that he should take me into his confidence and tell me everything i was as curious about his affairs then as you are about mine now he granted my conditions why you will see presently this put in short is what i heard from him he did not willingly tell me all that i tell you here i drew some of it from him by persuasion and some of it by questions i was determined to have all the truth and i believe i got it he knew no more than any one else of what the state of things really was between his father and mother till after the mother's death then his father confessed it and promised to do what he could for his son he died having done nothing not having even made a will the son who can blame him wisely provided for himself he came to england at once and took possession of the property there was no one to suspect him and no one to say nay his father and mother had always lived as man and wife none of the people who were acquainted with them ever supposed them to be anything else the right person to claim the property if the truth had been known was a distant relation who had no idea of ever getting it and who was away at sea when his father died he had no difficulty so far he took possession as a matter of course but he could not borrow money on the property as a matter of course there were two things wanted of him before he could do this one was a certificate of his birth and the other was a certificate of his parents marriage the certificate of his birth was easily got he was born abroad and the certificate was there in due form the other matter was a difficulty and that difficulty brought him to old wilmingham but for one consideration he might have gone to knollsbury instead his mother had been living there just before she met with his father living under her maiden name the truth being that she was really a married woman married in ireland where her husband had ill-used her and had afterwards gone off with some other person i give you this fact on good authority sir felix mentioned it to his son as the reason why he had not married you may wonder why the son knowing that his parents had met each other at knollsbury did not play his first tricks with the register of that church where it might have been fairly presumed his father and mother were married the reason was that the clergyman who did duty at knollsbury church in the year of eighteen hundred and three when according to his birth certificate his father and mother ought to have been married was alive still when he took possession of the property in the new year of eighteen hundred and twenty seven this awkward circumstance forced him to extend his inquiries to our neighbourhood there no such danger existed the former clergyman at our church having been dead for some years old wellingham suited his purpose as well as knollsbury his father had removed his mother from knollsbury and had lived with her at a cottage on the river at a little distance from our village people had known his solitary ways when he was single did not wonder at his solitary ways when he was supposed to be married if he had not been a hideous creature to look at his retired life with a lady might have raised suspicions but as things were his hiding his ugliness and his deformity in the strictest privacy surprised nobody he lived in our neighbourhood till he came in possession of the park after three or four and twenty years had passed 
who was to say, the clergyman being dead, that this marriage had not been as private as the rest of his life, and that it had not taken place at old Wellmingham Church. So, as I told you, the son found our neighborhood the surest place he could choose to set things right, secretly, in his own interests. It may surprise you to hear that what he really did to the marriage register was done on the spur of the moment, done on second thoughts. His first notion was only to tear the leaf out in the right year and month, to destroy it privately, to go back to London, and to tell the lawyers to get him the necessary certificate of his father's marriage, innocently referring them, of course, to the date on the leaf that was gone. Nobody could say his father and mother had not been married after that, and whether under the circumstances they would stretch a point or not about lending him the money, he thought they would. He had his answer ready at all events, if a question was ever raised about his right to the name and the estate. But when he came to look privately at the register for himself, he found at the bottom of one of the pages for the year of 1803 a blank space left, seemingly through there being no room to make a long entry there, which had been made instead at the top of the next page. The sight of this chance altered all his plans. It was an opportunity he had never hoped for or thought of, and he took it. You know how. The blank space to have exactly tallied with his birth certificate ought to have occurred in the July part of the register. It occurred in the September part instead. However, in this case, if suspicious questions were asked, the answer was not hard to find. He had only to describe himself as a seven months child. I was fool enough when he told me his story to feel some interest and some pity for him, which was just what he calculated on, as you will see. I thought him hardly used. It was not his fault that his father and mother were not married, and it was not his father's and mother's fault either. A more scrupulous woman than I was, a woman who had not set her heart on a gold watch and chain, would have found some excuses for him. At all events, I held my tongue and helped to screen what he was about. He came some time getting the ink, the right color, mixing it over and over again in pots and bottles of mine, and some time afterward in practicing the handwriting. But he succeeded in the end and made an honest woman of his mother after she was dead in her grave. So far, I don't deny that he behaved honorably enough to myself. He gave me my watch and chain and spared no expense in buying them. Both were of superior workmanship and very expensive. I have got them still. The watch goes beautifully. You said the other day that Mrs. Clements had told you everything she knew. In that case, there is no need for me to write about the trumpery scandal by which I was the sufferer, the innocent sufferer, I positively assert. You must know as well as I do what the notion was which my husband took into his head when he found me and my fine gentleman acquaintance meeting each other privately and talking secrets together. But what you don't know is how it ended between that same gentleman and myself. You shall read and see how he behaved to me. The first words I said to him when I saw the turn things had taken were, Do me justice, clear my character of the stain on it which you know I don't deserve. I don't want you to make a clean breast of it to my husband. Only tell him on your word as a gentleman that he is wrong, and that I am not to blame in the way he thinks I am. Do me that justice, at least, after all I have done for you. He flatly refused in so many words. He told me plainly that it was his interest to let my husband and all my neighbors believe the falsehood, because as long as they did so they were quite certain never to suspect the truth. I had a spirit of my own, and I told him they should know the truth from my lips. His reply was short and to the point. If I spoke, I was a lost woman, as certainly as he was a lost man. Yes, it had come to that. He had deceived me about the risk I ran in helping him. He had practiced my ignorance. He had tempted me with his gifts. He had interested me with his story. And the result of it was that he made me his accomplice. He owned this coolly, and he ended by telling me for the first time what the frightful punishment really was for his offense, and for any one who helped him to commit it. In those days the law was not so tender-hearted as I hear it is now. Murderers were not the only people liable to be hanged, and women convicts were not treated like ladies in undeserved distress. I confess he frightened me, the mean impostor, 
the cowardly blackguard. Do you understand now how I hated him? Do you understand why I am taking all this trouble, thankfully taking it, to gratify the curiosity of the meritorious young gentleman who hunted him down? Well, to go on, he was hardly fool enough to drive me to downright desperation. I was not the sort of woman who it was quite safe to hunt into a corner. He knew that, and wisely quieted me with proposals for the future. I deserved some reward, he was kind enough to say, for the service I had done him, and some compensation he was so obliging as to add, for what I had suffered. He was quite willing, generous scoundrel, to make me a handsome yearly allowance, payable quarterly, on two conditions. First, I was to hold my tongue, in my own interests as well as in his. Secondly, I was not to stir away from Wilmingham without first letting him know, and waiting till I had obtained his permission. In my own neighbourhood, no virtuous female friends would tempt me into dangerous gossiping at the tea-table. In my own neighbourhood, he would always know where to find me. A hard condition, that second one, but I accepted it. What else was I to do? I was left helpless, with the prospect of a coming encumbrance in the shape of a child. What else was I to do? Cast myself on the mercy of my runaway idiot of a husband who had raised the scandal against me? I would have died first. Besides, the allowance was a handsome one. I had a better income, a better house over my head, and better carpets on my floor than half the women who turned up the whites of their eyes at the sight of me. The dress of virtue in our parts was cotton print. I had silk. So I accepted the conditions he offered me, and made the best of them, and fought my battle with the respectable neighbors of their own ground, and won it in course of time, as you saw yourself. How I kept his secret and mine through all the years that have passed from that time to this, and whether my late daughter Anne ever really crept into my confidence and got the keeping of the secret too, are questions, I dare say, to which you are curious to find an answer. Well, my gratitude refuses you nothing. I will turn a fresh page and give you the answer immediately. But you must excuse one thing. You must excuse my beginning, Mr. Hartwright, with an expression of surprise at the interest which you appear to have felt in my late daughter. It is quite unaccountable to me. If that interest makes you anxious for any particulars of her early life, I must refer you to Mrs. Clements, who knows more of the subject than I do. Pray understand that I do not profess to have been at all over-fond of my late daughter. She was a worry to me from the first to the last, with the additional disadvantage of always being weak in the head. You like candor, and I hope this satisfies you. There is no need to trouble you with many personal particulars relating to those past times. It will be enough to say that I observed the terms of the bargain on my side, and that I enjoyed my comfortable income in return, paid quarterly. Now and then I got away and changed the scene for a short time, always asking leave of my lord and master first, and generally getting it. He was not, as I have already told you, fool enough to drive me too hard, and he could reasonably rely on my holding my tongue for my own sake, if not for his. One of my longest trips away from home was the trip I took to Limeridge to nurse a half-sister there who was dying. She was reported to have saved money, and I thought it as well, in case any accident happened to stop my allowance, to look after my own interests in that direction. As things turned out, however, my pains were all thrown away, and I got nothing, because nothing— was to be had. But I had taken Anne to the north with me, having my whims and fancies occasionally about my child, and getting at such times jealous of Mrs. Clemens' influence over her. I never liked Mrs. Clemens. She was a poor, empty-headed, spiritless woman, what you call a born drudge, and I was now and then not averse to plaguing her by taking Anne away. Not knowing what else to do with my girl while I was nursing in Cumberland, I put her to school in Limeridge. The lady of the manor, Mrs. Fairly, a remarkably plain-looking woman who had entrapped one of the handsomest men in England into marrying her, amused me wonderfully by taking a violent fancy to my girl. The consequence was she learned nothing in school and was petted and spoiled at Limeridge House. 
Among other whims and fancies which they taught her there, they put some nonsense into her head about always wearing white. Hating white and liking colors myself, I determined to take the nonsense out of her head as soon as we got home again. Strange to say, my daughter resolutely resisted me. When she had got a notion once fixed in her mind, she was, like other half-witted people, as obstinate as a mule in keeping it. We quarreled finally, and Mrs. Clemens, not liking to see it, I suppose, offered to take Anne away to live in London with her. I should have said yes, if Mrs. Clemens had not sided with my daughter about her dressing herself in white, but being determined she should not dress herself in white, and disliking Mrs. Clemens more than ever for taking part against me, I said no, and meant no, and stuck to no. The consequence was my daughter remained with me, and the consequence of that, in its turn, was at the first serious quarrel that happened about the secret. The circumstance took place long after the time I have just been writing of. I had been settled for years in the new town, and was steadily living down my bad character and slowly gaining ground among the respectable inhabitants. It helped me forward greatly towards this object to have my daughter with me. Her harmlessness and her fancy for dressing in white excited a certain amount of sympathy. I left off opposing her favorite whim on that account, because of some of the sympathy was sure, in course of time, to fall to my share. Some of it did fall. I date my getting a choice of the two best sittings to live in the church from that time, and I date the clergyman's first bow for my getting the sittings. Well being settled in this way, I received a letter one morning from that highly-born gentleman now deceased, in answer to one of mine, warning him, according to agreement, of my wishing to leave the town for a little change of air and scene. The ruffinly side of him must have been uppermost, I suppose, when he got my letter, for he wrote back refusing me in such abominably insolent language that I lost all command over myself and abused him in my daughter's presence as a low impostor whom I could ruin for life if I chose to open my lips and let out his secret. I said no more about him than that, being brought to my senses as soon as those words had escaped me by the sight of my daughter's face looking eagerly and curiously at mine. I instantly ordered her out of the room until I composed myself again. My sensations were not pleasant, I can tell you, when I came to reflect upon my own folly. Anne had been more than usually crazy and queer that year, and when I thought of the chance there might be of her repeating my words in town, and mentioning his name in connection with them, if inquisitive people got hold of her, I was finally terrified at the possible consequences. My worst fears for myself, my worst dread of what he might do, led me no farther than this. I was quite unprepared for what really did happen only the next day. On the next day, without any warning to me to expect him, he came to the house. His first words, and the tone in which he spoke them, surely, as it was, showed me plainly enough that he had repented already of his insolent answer to my application, and that he had come, in a mighty bad temper, to try and set matters right again, before it was too late. Seeing my daughter in the room with me, I had been afraid to let her out of my sight after what had happened the day before, he ordered her away. They neither of them liked each other, and he vented the ill temper on her, which he was afraid to show me. "'Leave us,' he said, looking at her over his shoulder. She looked back over her shoulder and waited as if she didn't care to go. "'Do you hear?' he roared out. "'Leave the room!' "'Speak to me civilly,' says she, getting red in the face. "'Turn the idiot out,' says he, looking my way. She had always had crazy notions of her own about her dignity, and that word idiot upset her in a moment. Before I could interfere, she stepped up to him in a fine passion. "'Beg my pardon directly,' says she, "'or I'll make it worse for you. I'll let out your secret. I can ruin you for life if I choose to open my lips.' My own words repeated exactly from what I had said the day before, repeated in his presence, as if they had come from herself. He sat down speechless, as white as the paper I am writing on, while I pushed her out of the room. When he recovered himself, 
No, I am too respectable a woman to mention what he said when he recovered himself. My pen is the pen of a member of the rector's congregation, and a subscriber to the Wednesday lectures on justification by faith. How can you expect me to employ it in writing bad language? Suppose for yourself the raging, swearing frenzy of the lowest ruffian in England, and let us get on together, as fast as may be, to the way in which it all ended. It ended, as you probably guess by this time, in his insisting on securing his own safety by shutting her up. I tried to set things right. I told him that she had merely repeated like a parrot the word she had heard me say, that she knew no particulars whatever, because I had mentioned none. I explained that she had affected, out of crazy spite against him, to know what she really did not know that she only wanted to threaten him and aggravate him for speaking to her as he had just spoken, and that my unlucky words gave her just the chance of doing mischief of which she was in search. I referred to him in other queer ways of hers, and to his own experience of the vagaries of half-witted people. It was all to no purpose. He would not believe me on my oath. He was absolutely certain I had betrayed the whole secret. In short, he would hear of nothing but shutting her up. Under these circumstances I did my duty as a mother. No pauper asylum, I said. I won't have her put in a pauper asylum. A private establishment, if you please. I have my feelings as a mother, and my character to preserve in this town, and I will submit to nothing but a private establishment, of the sort which my genteel neighbors would choose for afflicted relatives of their own. Those were my words. It is gratifying to me to reflect that I did my duty. Though never over-fond of my late daughter, I had a proper pride about her. No pauper stain, thanks to my firmness and resolution, ever rested on my child. Having carried my point, which I did the more easily in consequence of the facilities offered by private asylums, I could not refuse to admit that there were certain advantages gained by shutting her up. In the first place, she was taken excellent care of, being treated, as I took care to mention in the town, on the footing of a lady. In the second place, she was kept away from Wellingham, where she might have set people suspecting and inquiring by repeating my own incautious words. The only drawback of putting her under restraint was a very slight one. We merely turned her empty boast about knowing the secret into a fixed delusion. Having first spoken in sheer crazy spitefulness against the man who had offended her, she was cunning enough to see that she had seriously frightened him, and sharp enough afterward to discover that he was concerned in shutting her up. The consequence was she flamed out into a perfect frenzy of passion against him, going to the asylum and the first words she said to the nurses after they had quieted her were that she was put in confinement for knowing his secret and that she meant to open her lips and ruin him when the right time came. She may have said the same thing to you when you thoughtlessly assisted her escape. She certainly said it, as I heard last summer, to the unfortunate woman who married our sweet-tempered, nameless gentleman lately deceased. If either you or that unlucky lady had questioned my daughter closely, and had insisted on her explaining what she really meant, you would have found her lose all her self-importance suddenly, and get vacant and restless and confused, you would have discovered that I am writing nothing here but the plain truth. She knew that there was a secret. She knew who was connected with it. She knew who would suffer by its being known. And beyond that, whatever airs of importance she may have given herself, whatever crazy boasting she may have indulged in with strangers, she never to her dying day knew more. Have I satisfied your curiosity? I have taken pains enough to satisfy it at any rate. There is really nothing else I have to tell you about myself or my daughter. My worst responsibilities, so far as she was concerned, were all over when she was secured in the asylum. I had a form of letter relating to the circumstances under which she was shut up, given me to write in answer to one Miss Holcomb, who was curious in the matter, and who must have heard plenty of lies about me from a certain tongue well accustomed to telling of the same. And I did what I could afterwards to trace my runaway daughter, 
and prevent her from doing mischief by making inquiries myself in the neighbourhood where she was falsely reported to have been seen. But these, and other trifles like them, are of little or no interest to you after what you have already heard. So far I have written in the friendliest possible spirit, but I cannot close this letter without adding a word here of serious remonstrance and reproof addressed to yourself. In the course of your personal interview with me, you audaciously referred to my late daughter's parentage on the father's side, as if that parentage was a matter of doubt. This was highly improper and very ungentlemanlike on your part. If we see each other again, remember, if you please, that I will allow no liberties to be taken with my reputation and that the moral atmosphere of Wellingham, to use a favorite expression of my friend the rector's, must not be tainted by loose conversation of any kind. If you allow yourself to doubt that my husband was Anne's father, you personally insult me in the grossest manner. If you have felt, and if you still continue to feel, an unhallowed curiosity on this subject, I recommend you, in your own interests, to check it at once and forever. On this side of the grave, Mr. Hartwright, whatever may happen on the other, that curiosity will never be gratified. Perhaps after what I have just said, you will see the necessity of writing me an apology. Do so, and I will willingly receive it. I will afterwards, if your wishes point to a second interview with me, go a step farther and receive you. My circumstances only enable me to invite you to tea not that they are at all altered for the worse by what has happened. I have always lived, as I think I told you, well within my income, and I have saved enough in the last twenty years to make me quite comfortable for the rest of my life. It is not my intention to leave Wellingham. There are one or two little advantages which I have still to gain in the town. The clergyman bows to me, as you saw. He is married, and his wife is not quite so civil. I propose to join the Dorcas Society, and I mean to make the clergyman's wife bow to me next. If you favor me with your company, pray understand that the conversation must be entirely on general subjects. Any attempted reference to this letter will be quite useless. I am determined not to acknowledge having written it. The evidence has been destroyed in the fire, I know, but I think it desirable to err on the side of caution. Nevertheless, on this account, no names are mentioned here, nor is any signature attached to these lines. The handwriting is disguised throughout, and I mean to deliver the letter myself, under circumstances which will prevent all fear of its being traced to my house. You can have no possible cause to complain of these precautions, seeing that they do not affect the information I here communicate in consideration of the special indulgence which you have deserved at my hands. My hour for tea is half-past five, and my buttered toast waits for nobody. End of track 32